That Great Business Show. Winner, Highly Commended Award. Irish Podcast Awards. Welcome to episode 176 of That Great Business Show, home of great business tips, insights, and opportunities on every episode delivered in our commute friendly package. And it's all thanks to de facto shaving oil, the world's best shaving oil. Not a beard oil, it's a shaving oil. Just a couple of drops onto a wet face and you are sorted. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. It's your ideal travel companion. De facto shave.com. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. I am Conal O'Mora and Fautistia. Coming up today, former Connecticut State Senator Brian McDermott rounds off our Beachhead USA miniseries with a request to US companies to set up in Ireland, particularly to his family's hometown of Dundalk. And we are talking pensions, but not boring old pensions, but a neat, young and scaling Irish startup that is making setting up a pension plan and other things in small businesses easy peasy. I think I met my first guest on this episode back a while when he had co-founded an ordering service called Bamboo. And then he became country manager for Bolt, the e-bike and taxi service. Then he set up a company called Yonder that has now become Kota. That's the only name you need to remember, Kota. Kota enables companies to set up, manage and automate core financial benefits from multiple providers internationally. It means employees can access health or retirement or life assurance providers globally with real-time enrollment, flexible contributions and an employee app all in just one place and things are going fantastic. They've raised 7.6 million euro primed for takeoff methinks. Luke Mackey, CEO and co-founder of Cota, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thanks for having me on. 7.6 million quid. You are primed for the big time. Well, yeah, I think it just shows that we're building something that's, um, I think we're building something that's in a space there's a lot of opportunity, right? So it's well, you, you say right, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, like, well, well, put it this way, everyone has a pension, one way or another. In Ireland, a good 60% of people contribute to their health insurance. In most countries, that's like in, in the UK, it's a very, very fast growing space as well. And now employers, particularly good employers, are expected to contribute to these things. But it's not easy. It's very, it's, it's very similar to maybe what it's like to deal with a financial institution in the 2000s. It's, it's still a lot of paper-based, still a lot of paperwork involved. We're trying to bring that online and work. And you, I think you're suggesting that you're, this, this is a kind of a Stripe type operation. Technically it is. Yeah, a little, a little bit. So um, if I was to compare a little bit of Stripes from bringing banks online, making it possible to move money around, making it possible to bring payments online, and I think they're, they're, they talk about is increasing the GDP of the internet, and by doing that, they make it possible to take payments everywhere. For when it comes to these types of products, obviously on a much smaller scale, like not everyone's getting these types of products um, regularly as they are making payments for something on a, on, a, on a clothing website or any sort of subscription payment. But for core benefits, what we call like pensions, health insurance, life insurance, income protection. It's not something that's really online. And in Europe, it's quite fragmented. And we realized, I found that out myself when I was kind of from my own experience as a 24, 25 year old trying to set these up for other companies. And what we're trying to do is just bring them online. We're trying to bring them online and make them far more accessible. Whether that's accessible through our own platform, where small companies can go and set up a pension for their team or health insurance for their team or life insurance for their team. Do that not only in Ireland, but in the UK or across Europe, or also through our developer tools, which allows kind of other HR tools to do that. But more importantly, it means that employees get access to things they probably wouldn't have easily got access to. And it means the company of 10 people can, without having to speak to an insurance broker, go on a website and get started. They're going to love you. They will, yeah. <laughs> no, they do, they do. Because we make it really cheap and really, really easy for them. But I hate asking this question. But why you? How do you know how to get around this one? How do you know how to crack this one? I think it's mainly just, we, I don't know, maybe it's, a, it's just, I think it's a personality thing more than anything else. When I see something that really annoys me and that would annoy me if it never got fixed, and if I sat on it for a while, I just need to try it. And it's, I probably sat on this one for about two or three years and it looked hard. I think that was one of the reasons why I don't think anyone else 
there was a very few people who wanted to try it. So we took a crack at it, myself and my other two co-founders, both of whom I worked with before in my last company in Bamboo. And we knew we wanted to start something again. And we kept going back to <laughs> It's it, a like, madness, you know. It is. It's, it's insanity. It absolutely is insanity. And we all had this problem. I had this problem when I was working for another company, an international company. And I had to set up benefits for the team in Dublin. And I had to go and set up a PRSA, which is a, a personal pension product to set up for our team. It took us about three or four months to set up. Way too long for that to, to, to go through. And then I don't think, I think I was the only person who actually contributed to it. Everyone else was too busy investing in crypto or something. They didn't want to get their tax relief. And then my co-founders, one of them was working in an Irish startup that was growing really quickly. It went from like 100 people to three or 400 people in the space of a year. And they didn't have any benefits infrastructure in place. So when they were hiring more senior people, it became a difficult task because they weren't giving them access to a pension. Bizarre. And then my other co-founder, Patrick, he was working for himself. He was consulting and he wanted to set up a director's pension and just got lost in the paperwork. He was in his middle, mid-20s. So we just saw this as a problem that needed to be solved. Problem for a generation that we're not used to this type of benefit, say. Than this type of transaction even. And how did you three manage yep. to crack it? I mean, what have you done that others haven't or couldn't or didn't? I think, well, we all come from backgrounds where the user is the prime person in, in the equation. It's the employee experience. It's the user experience. It's essentially, it's exceptionally user-centric. So we try to bring everything back to first principles and fundamentals of how do we make this product really, really simple. Firstly, for the employer to get access to these things because if the, the employer is the gatekeeper. So how do you make it really easy and cost-effective and quick for a small company to set these benefits up? And then when we knew if we did that, then we can build a really good user experience where it's like a mobile user experience. You can enroll in a couple of minutes and access things that ultimately you're going to be contributing to for a very, very long time and be accumulating for a very, very long time. So we start, we really, the way most of these things start is you, you getting in a room with people and designing it and spending, like we took days off work where we just go and hack away at ideas. Oh, lovely. You were working at this time when you were setting yes, this up. Yeah, I love absolutely. those stories. Yeah, yeah, love yeah, them. yeah. And we all, we all try to convince ourselves not to do this. I think that's a really, that's a really good place to be. Like we actually convinced ourselves not to do this. I built a pitch deck for myself to pitch myself and try and pitch myself not to do it. So I built a lot of collateral around it and showed it to people who are way more informed than me, way smarter than me to tell me that this was not a good idea. Like, unfortunately or fortunately, everyone kept telling me, no, you should do this. <laughs> um, and I spoke to people who were, they were founders, they were people in the insurance industry, they were people in the financial services industry. And they were saying, you know what, like, this needs, this industry needs people like you to go and try and uh, try and make a change. <laughs> I have to do something now. And over time, I, I finally got the conviction to say, you know what, I'm going to, we all actually handed, we all finished up our jobs. And in, in early 2022, we decided to just go and try to go at it with our savings. Very quickly, we realized that all that kind of work we've done to try and convict ourselves to do this, to solve the problem, investors also had the same level of conviction. So in about two months, we had raised our pre-seed round, which wasn't an angel-led round. It was actually an institutional investor round. So it was led by Frontline Ventures in Dublin and Northstone Ventures in the UK. We and did. they gave you 2 million? 2.6 in total, yeah. 2.6 million. So, um, Not bad for a start. How many months were you going? About two months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, pretty early. When you got that money... I and mean, of course you smiled. Did you laugh? Did you say, wow, we're, this is mad? No, I immediately go back to work. <laughs> Seriously, no, I, I'm very bad at celebrating wins. But all that does is is it adds fuel to the rocket. Say, so, okay, instead of us, now the, the ambition has gotten bigger, the responsibility has gotten bigger, the pressure is larger too. So it just it makes us think differently about the about where we could go. So no longer is this maybe, maybe is a narrow aperture of where we wanted to go in our first say, year or first two years, we actually could increase the aperture a bit. And... Yeah, we did. So we, very quickly, in about nine months, we built, we hired our first part, I remember probably about six months, actually, we hired our our, te- our kind of core team, which is about four or five people. Um, Here or abroad? Mix. So some engineers in Ireland, some engineers abroad. That was mainly the core part of the team. So we had compliance in Ireland as well. And we started building our regulatory fundamentals. We started building which our... Which must be the real nightmare, surely. Yes, That's it, yeah, isn't it's it? The, it's the hardest thing, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely. So particularly for when you're a startup and you don't come from this industry, you have a lot of quick learnings. And who or where would you go to find out, say, about regulation and about regulatory issues? <laughs> it's kind of going back to those people that told me that I need to try this at the start. And so they're kind of people who help you connect. But also there's people out there whose job this is to, and thankfully we, you raise the money, you, may, you don't make the mistakes as well. So very quickly you you make sure you don't, you're don't you not making mistakes more than once and you can go and pay for that. <laughs> so we went to things like consultants and stuff like that too. And But ultimately we partner with a really good broker here that got us up off our feet and then what we did was we wanted to sell our first products or if we partnered with Irish Life in Ireland, mainly because of the, the incredible products that they have, but also the, the range of products in the country. So we knew we wanted to have a full suite. We wanted to have health, pension, life insurance, income protection. They're the kind of key products that an employer would provide to their employees. And so we were, it was kind of one place that we can go in and procure that and, and get, make that available in our product. 
our, in our solution. And yeah, we sold, sold health insurance in the first year, and then we launched pensions in early 23. And then we felt like we had a far more suitable product to the markets. And now we've got, to give you a, a taste of where we are now, we've got health pension on life in Ireland, fully integrated, easily to set up. You can set up those benefits in minutes. Uh, minutes. Yeah. So you come in to me and you say, I can set this up for you. And I say, I have, say, 10 employees. Mm -hmm. You can do it immediately. Yeah, yeah. costs you 90 euro a month. So that's your model. It's Nine a, euro it's, per employee per month, yeah. So it's a, um, a subscription model, yeah? <laughs> yep. Okay. And then, so you go into our web app, our website, you can add your members, your employees easily. You can also, we also, if you have a HR tool, you can sync with that. So your employees go work from there. So it takes the work out away from you. Decide what you want to give them. So you said, okay, I want to give them access to a health insurance plan. Here's the plans available. Here's what might be suitable for you. You can pick the contribution amount you want to give, whether that's a, a low contribution, monetary contribution, or give them a higher contribution will cover the full price of those plans. Or you want to give them a pension as well. And you pick your match contribution you want to give them. And it could be as little as 1% and, or, or life and get a quote in the product. And then you can switch on they get invited and they're covered. That all happens in probably less than five minutes. The employee, we see about 75%, 80% activation rate from the employees. So it's really, really high engagement from the employees because they're getting an email to an app, they enroll in the app. It's really easy to use. It's very transparent. And yeah, and then that's they, they don't think they don't have access to something and they're getting covered and they can manage it all for themselves. I presume that you've done your market research and is there anybody anywhere across Europe, across the world, who is doing anything similar? There's really big brokers. So that's the problem. Like, so the big brokers are the big consultants in the world, like the, the Aeons, the Mercers, the Willis Harris Watsons. We've probably all heard their names. They're on the shirts of football teams. Um, they're the guys who... <laughs> A sure sign they have too much money. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yes. Um, but they're consultants, right? They're advisories and they're not tech companies. And tends to be tech companies tend to be the ones that Try start from something that's very, I think if you start from a very agile place, you can shift way more easily than these guys. These guys are like tanker ships. So those are the guys who are serving the big clients, the big guys. And they, because there's so much manual, I suppose, manual administrative work in this industry, because it is quite offline, it means they have to charge high fees. And those high fees are not just charged for the work, but they're charged for the advisory. And if you want to get access to a tech platform that won't look anything like ours, you pay extra for that too. So that's who we're kind of competing with, those big boys. And you're straight in after them now, are you? We will. So yeah, we, we take business from them all the time. But the business that we're taking from them is probably the business they don't even think about. But they will fight back. I'm sure they will. I look forward to it. Yeah. Because you also have, besides the 2.6 million that you raised, you've got another 5 million on top of that. So you're are building a nice little arsenal. Yeah. And that gives us the ability to hire great people, which we've done. And we're up to team of 22 people. It gives us the ability to start investing in sales, which we're starting to do because we know our product's in a really good place. And we're growing revenue to a place where we knowing that we've built something that people want, which is the most important thing. And what are the problems? There are problems. You have to have had problems. I can, think, you, can you find I engineers? Think, I think, I think, uh, yeah. Can you get good salespeople? There's loads of different dynamics. Like Ireland is a kind of a sales hub for a lot of companies. So if you want to break down certain problems, like there's some really, really good salespeople in Ireland, but you just have to be nowhere to find them and you have to be able to understand the motivation behind why someone wants to go work for a startup that is going to it's going to be quite intense. It's going to be long hours. It's going to be figuring out things that aren't yet figured out. And you're going to be left with a lot of autonomy. And that's so, so what is the answer? What are they? Problems. What are you finding? And why are they joining you? Well, it, it comes back to the motivation. And I think Ireland has kind of built a, uh, we've built an ecosystem where people are able to work from home and just hit quota and they can log off at 5.30. And that, that's fine. And it's that dynamic and that's fine. But it's just hard to weed through those people to make sure that we're not trying to hire those people right now. We're not going to be hiring those people for a very, very long time. We're trying to hire the people who really want to make change and drive themselves. I would well, say one problem. So well, well hang on a second now. You are looking for those people. How do you even start finding out what these people are like? How many interviews can you do in a day, a week, a year? Like it'd be endless amounts yeah, of time. Yeah, we do three interviews. So we will do a, obviously we'll, we'll get an application in and we'll, we'll kind of try to make a judgment based on the application and then we'll uh, do a, a quick interview to understand, just kind of understand them and what motivates them. And then we'll do a task so we get to understand kind of more of how they would approach certain certain scenarios. So they, they do a task on like how they would sell a product and they, they write a cold email, all that kind of stuff. So you learn, who, who does that assessment? Do you? I don't do it anymore. I'm involved in it, but it's Matthew, our head of sales on when it comes to sales. Because so that does take Matthew time, Brown. doesn't it? It takes a lot of time, yeah. We're, yeah. we're like, hiring. Hiring is one of the most important things you can do in a company. You have to I think the biggest thing around hiring is saying no more than you say yes, when you even, even when you, we get really far with people. So yeah, I think that in Ireland, that's a case of trying to find the right people when it comes to sales, because there's a big bucket of people who've trained on sales. We're in an industry that's an old school industry. As I mentioned, like there's a reason why we're playing in the space and it's because it's difficult to play in the space. So it's quite slow. It tends to be very offline as well, as I mentioned. So trying to bring it online has a lot of different dynamics and it's also regulated. It's, that's a huge thing as well. It's a working in a regulated environment that needs to be respected and there's a lot of controlled elements of what we do to make sure that we're operating in a compliant way. So we've built that from day one. And Who is your regulator as a matter of interest? Is it Central Bank? We've got or? two. So we operate in the, we're operating in, obviously in Ireland and the EU. So that's Central Bank of Ireland. And then we're about to switch on in the UK, which will be the FCA. 
And any pushback at all from them? Do they say, who are these young whippersnappers? Or? No, it's not pushback. It's just working between the lines and just making sure that you're building the right controls and structure in place in the company that allows you to be quite compliant. And we've done that. We've, we're already ISO approved as well, which is like a very high security grade and everything. We've put compliance in from day dot. We had a head of compliance in. was one of our first hires. But strictly speaking, you are not handling any money anyway, anywhere. You are pure platform. Is no, that we it? handle money. We move money. Do yeah, you? Yeah. So that's okay. everything is done through us. So you can you're, you add your your company debit card or your bank, and we that's everything that runs through us. But can your company don't physically you can't get to the money? I mean, it's, it's going through your money. system. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, of course. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that actually gets you over a big hurdle. Of course. I and mean, if you're actually putting cash po- into your back pocket or something, and no, that's not no, no, such no, a it's just from the client to the uh, insurer. Yeah. And on your pitch deck, which I am sure that you have well polished, what is the size of the market that you can think of? Say, give me some ideas, two to three years and maybe five years. Well, if I just look at, I'm not going to put the exact number on. Oh, please it, do. It's, because it's, it varies, like, because you can, you can take the insurance market, you can take the, the consulting market. And when we, you're raising the cash, when yeah. you went into, and you better name your new backers as yeah, well, yeah, because yeah. they'll love that. What were you telling them? Well, it's close to 100 billion in terms of the European market size. And we actually think that's undervalued. We think it can be a lot bigger. Total or not served? In other words, that's is total, that, yeah. So, yeah, we, so we, that's we, already being served. That's being served. But you want to eat into that. You want to eat into that. And we also think there's an opportunity to increase that because there's a whole other workforce that aren't getting served. Such as? Well, there's a lot more smaller companies out there right now than there was maybe when my parents were working. So my mom worked in the bank for 35 years. It means that this pension started contributing on day one was the same pension she was contributing on, on when, she was, when she was retiring. Now people move company every two, three years. And um, that's just kind of typical what you see of a younger generation. And those companies don't tend to always be the, the LinkedIn and the Facebooks, but there's medium-sized companies, smaller companies, traditional companies, and they don't have that infrastructure to be able to, to do that in a way that is the offboarding, the onboarding, the setting these schemes up, moving people around. Um, so we think like, if there's a generation of employee that's not set up correctly, I and mean, that's mainly because there's the infrastructure isn't there to reserve smaller companies. So we, tw- we think there's a, whole other, there's a whole other cohort of companies that need to be served. Not only that, we think there's also self-employed. When you go kind of more towards gig economy and, as and individuals and freelancers, that's a whole other area that needs to be served too. We're not tackling that just yet. We're tackling the smaller companies now and the agile companies, the remote companies. That's where we go after. But we do know that later on, we do want to go after the, and be able to help those serve those kind of freelancers. That We think that will increase the, the size of the market by about 10%, at least. And I presume when you were raising the second tranche and the first tranche of cash that you had to put some sen- give some sense of profitability or when you might be profitable. When is that likely to happen? I think venture capitalists like the word profitability, like the word growth. But in terms of where I we... want to make sure that you're making money so that you yeah, keep going yeah. to grow. Well, 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 this year, I think we'll be in place. We'll be, we'll, we're, like, by the end of this year, judging by some of the deals we're doing at the moment, well, if we wanted to be profitable, we probably could You'll be, be breaking even, will you? Maybe. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. That's well done, yeah. So then what's the next step after that? You're, like, this is now... Uh, we're I think the year one. Uh, put it this way: these all those sizes of the market I'm talking about. There, that's not going to. That's uh, you have to be very, very aggressive to go after that market. So it will just be if all going well, and with every startups, you never know, uh, it may not work out. You do need to double down and and be just absolutely relentlessly ambitious to how you are going after this. So and is Luke Mackey, as you say yourself, relentlessly ambitious? Yeah, quite. Cool. <laughs> Where did you get that? I don't know. And amb- ambition towards what? To be the biggest platform for this kind of insurance or to be driving your um, the sun oh, just, yacht? Oh, or? Just making, doing things that are interesting and making change, yeah. I don't know. You have to, if you want to go deeper, you probably have to speak to my therapist. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, to be honest, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it is just a case that we won't make, it, like, this, this isn't an Irish problem, this is a, a global problem. And very quickly, we've already tried to try and do this internationally, and that's the we already serve companies who are international. And you say you're 22 at the moment, like growing and growing, growing. You mentioned uh, earlier uh, a yeah. company that grew from 100 to 300. Yeah, yeah. That is Those a times are massive amount of work. yeah, and it's doing that sustainably. So like the, the right now, we've hired a lot on the the product and engineering side, which is the core infrastructure of what we're building, and we've done a lot of work there and we've invested heavily there. Now it's kind of around revenue generation role, so we're we're about to invest a good bit into sales. And um, we'll then invest into marketing probably second half of this year. And yeah, I think like, everything we do has to have a KPI attached to it. So we know what our plan is for the end of the year. And if all goes to plan, we know how many people we could potentially hire. Um, but if you don't do that, it's not going to be that level of growth. So yeah, I think like 22 now, maybe at the end of the year, we're kind of in, in the 30 mark, closer, about 30, um, all going well. But a lot of that will be kind of 
uh, account managers and sales and marketing and things like that. And when you set up in the UK, you didn't mention North America yet. Are you going to go into North America? It's not on the time horizon for at least the next two years now. It's a very okay. different problem. But if you go into the other markets, be that uh, UK or EU, boots on the ground, are you going to have to decamp? Are you going to live in somewhere nice like Paris or Madrid? Or? Uh, I'm not sure. So right now, right now I'm, I'm on a plane every pretty regularly. I think I did 40 flights last year, so I'm not the best for the old the climate, but... I, do, uh, I don't necessarily need to be moving over anywhere soon, but what we'll do is we sell directly into some markets. So we'll sell them out into markets where we'll actually have boots on the ground, like Ireland, the UK, potentially some Central European countries like the, Fran- the France of the world, Germany, Portugal, Spain, and then other markets we're just serving. So it means that you could be a UK company and you've got employees in Portugal, and we have a, a local health insurer available in Portugal, a local pension. And where would you have come across them? The companies? Yeah. Anywhere. So you can get it from, like, it's from direct sales, it's from partnerships. So we do a lot of integrations. We integrate with lots of accounting tools and HR tools, and they kind of come from us there. But, and where are you finding your partners? Oh, the insurers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is very much, it's, it's, it's a mix. It's mainly, it, the reality is most of it is us going in and, and uh, kind of procuring them and going and making them aware of us. We're so small. Well, like, and tell me again how you do that. I mean, uh, if there's a Portuguese uh, life insurance company that you're yeah. trying to talk to, do you pick up the phone to them? Or? The reality is we're not, so you, yeah, the reality is it's a very different process. We're not selling to them. We're becoming an agent of them and then yeah. and then working to make sure that we're able to provide a level of experience in our product. So um, thankfully, these these insurance companies are, are motivated by money. <laughs> so you can go and say, hey, we're, we want to distribute your product. And they're very willing and, and keen to hear about how you're going to do that. And then when we see how, how we're doing, how we're going to do that, they get quite excited. Okay, well, now, one of the part of the shtick of the podcast is we're always looking for opportunities for the listeners. What opportunities are out there working with you or what can they do for you that, you can, that they could partner with you on? Well, the insurance companies, you mean? Anybody who's listening. So that could be an insurance employee, an insurance company employee, an insurance company owner, somebody who may be listening in South Africa. Could be anybody. Is there an opportunity in working with Cota? There's loads of opportunities to work with us. So like when it comes to insurance companies, the likelihood is they're going to be able to sell things a lot cheaper because they don't have to deal with the kind of the operational overhead that they would usually have to deal with, with, with paper-based applications or something like that. We usually, we're, we're, we're taking things through API. So it's just policy sold and it's money in the bank for everyone. And it's a great experience for the employees. They're likely going to stick it to, for the end user. They're probably going to stick around a lot longer and are far less to churn, far less likely to churn because we have this awesome experience then for the company and the employee. Maybe for the companies that, that, that are out there as well that want to actually uh, give, their ben- give employees their uh, benefits. And the reason why we don't, well, the reason why we, we, we see a lot of kind of the education in the market is because a lot of small companies have this huge inertia about saying giving their employees health insurance or giving them access to a pension or retirement plan. Um, that's because of cost and it's because of the, the, the time they think and the administration they think it, it entails. Um, when the reality is it's, it's actually not that. It maybe typically was that if you go through it in a kind of a traditional route. But with us, it's maybe a fractional increase on your payroll. It can be budget based as well. So instead of having to pay for an entire health insurance policy, which is Maybe you say, okay, we actually have to go procure it and go, we want to offer them this plan from this insurer and we've done all the research. We take a lot of that away from you. We put a lot of that in the hands of the employee and ensure, and ensure user experience in our app where you can go to say, listen, we can only afford to contribute X amount per month. may not cover a full plan, but it might give them access. It might give them subsidized. And that means they can go and give them access to something when you're a smaller company. Usually, maybe typically, who's able to afford this, do this much cheaper. And the same goes for pension. Pension is usually just like a percentage of your gross, gross pay. And you can give them something towards that too. Um, and it's really accessible. Like our subscription fee is the same as nine euro a month. It's, a, it's three coffees. Three coffees. I was going to say, don't mention don't, coffees. I was just gonna, I'm sitting, sitting in front of me here. I have to think. Of, I, have to, I have to do it. Final question, because we ask this of everybody: Who would Luke Mackey hire in a heartbeat? Um, only because I've thought about this, and he's a friend. But is a guy called Dan Nugent? Have you ever heard of Amber Eyewear? I have. I have A M B or isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So Dan's. Dan, I, Dan, I know Dan from from around, and uh, he's a fantastic marketer. And he's great at building, uh, he's a great eye for product and design. And if it was to bring someone in, I'd definitely love to talk to him. But he's a pal. He's a sort of a pal, yeah, of course. Yeah. But so you could actually just pick up the phone to him. Yeah, but you asked me, you asked me the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking for somebody exotic. You know? Somebody who wants, you know, Michael O'Leary to work with them. And people like I was thinking that on the way in, but I don't think he's looking for a job right now. No, no, but he might, when he gets his 100 million uh, payoff, he might just uh, be looking for somebody, new, something new and exciting to yeah, do. If he wants to give some benefits to his, to his, to his employees, I'm sure they'd love it. They probably would. That is Luke. Luke Mackey, thank you so much for joining us on the That Great Business Show. That Great Business Show. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. 
No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. That great business show. Winner, highly commended award. Irish Podcast Awards. Trade is a two-way thing, whereas our mini-series that we have called Beachhead USA is mostly about Irish companies setting up units in the US. Of course, we welcome US companies coming to Ireland. Brian McDermott is an American. He was once Senator Brian McDermott, a member of the Connecticut State Legislature, but he gave it all up for rock and roll, or business as we prefer to call it. His consultancy advises US companies on moving into Europe, and he encourages those companies to use Ireland as their EU base. Brian McDermott, or should I call you ex-Senator Brian McDermott, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you very much, Connell. Uh, Brian, Brian is good. Brian, well, we call you Brian for a while and then we'll get all formal again. What's the demand for those kind of services? Because we love Irish, well, to name check just a few, Pfizer? Connecticut, correct? Absolutely. I think, and you may not know this, I think Pfizer once was 5% of our turnover in the country. It probably was. Back in the Viagra days. Remember those? <laughs> <laughs> so what is the demand from U.S. for the services that you provide? Well, it's, it's been a, a long road. I, I started in this process back in the early 90s, back before the Celtic Tiger even started off, when the European Union was pouring billions of dollars into Ireland and the Irish economy. God bless them, as we would say. Yeah. It's a lot has changed, though, since then. We've had a lot of ups and downs and turns in the road uh, where we've had uh, great progress with the Celtic Tiger and uh, brought a lot of international business to Ireland and brought the, the reputation of the Irish people, uh, rightfully so, to being the you know, highly educated and best workforce in the, in the world and attracted a lot of the uh, American companies to set up there. Well, hang on. When you say best workforce in the world, remember, you're still in Connecticut. There. Somebody might call around to your house <laughs> and say, what are you talking about? It's a great, great gateway. and It's a great marriage. That's what makes it so special because they're partnering up with the Connecticut workforce here as well. And we were trying to bring Connecticut companies over to Ireland during that time where they were uh, attracting people to set up shop in, in Ireland and use that as the gateway to the European Union. Uh, so we had a great workforce here. We were able to do some partners, joint ventures and, and the like, and really bring uh, Ireland to the to the map. So what is the demand now? Well, the demand now, because so much has changed and turned around, uh, we're, we've been trying to do a, a you know joint back and forth. And the, the Connecticut-Ireland uh, Alliance is really a, a fantastic opportunity to spotlight, uh, I think, on both sides of the of the Atlantic, where you have an opportunity to bring Irish companies here to help set up, and you have an opportunity for American or Connecticut companies to want to expand into the European Union. And there's no better place than Ireland to do that as well. And we, of course, believe that and accept that. But is it an easy sell to, you know, post-Brexit? What are they looking for? What should we be as a nation, as, a, as an economy, be looking out for? Like, yes, you said that we're the, you know, the greatest in the world, but in, re in reality, what are we maybe even missing that we should be correcting now for the future? Well, I think what starts is when you're looking at some of the great opportunities that, my family's from Dundalk in County Louth in Ireland. Uh, we have the Dundalk Institute of Technology, which has an amazing incubator uh, setup where incredible companies have come out of that incubator center and have gone all over the world. Uh, we had a company uh, that was there called uh, Statsports, uh, which uh, was a company that started in the Dundalk Institute and now uh, puts their monitors on, on, on soccer players uh, uniformed and they can track their movements across the field and give real life, real time data back to the coaches and the players. And that's, that's taken off considerably in the last 10 years. But that started in Dundalk in the Institute uh, with the incubator system. So trying to convince the people that are startup companies and those incubators that are really high tech opportunities to say that there is an opportunity to come uh, worldwide and the world is getting a much smaller place as we all know. And having them look at Connecticut as a place where Connecticut is looking to welcome uh, them. I know you, you uh, have talked in the past with Tony Sheridan from New London, uh, the Chamber of Commerce down there, and he has a beautiful incubator or meeting uh, uh, center where people can come and set up a shop there and have a have a desk or have a have a have a conference room or have ability to to meet and be able to meet people in Connecticut. Our governor 
Uh, Ned Lamont has done a fabulous job. We started off as a small business person and has made fabulous uh, inroads in his uh, uh, journey in business life and wants to spread that throughout Connecticut. He's a strong champion of Connecticut business and Connecticut innovation and is doing everything he can to help. So having the opportunity for the small incubator companies starting off in Ireland, coming over to try to expand their business in the United States, there's no better place than Connecticut. What do you call people from Connecticut? Are you nutmeggers or is this the nutmeg state, isn't it? <laughs> it is the nutmeg state. Yeah. What are people from Connecticut called so? And the nice name, not the other words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nutmeggers is, a, is a, a name that's been used. There. Do nutmeggers have a view on Irish companies, Irish people coming over or do they care or is it just business or strictly business? I think there's so much to learn and such a great opportunity to be able to share the great wealth. And having Aer Lingus flying out of uh, Hartford is something that's fantastic. And believe it or not, th that was one of the things that I worked on when I was in the legislature 30 years ago, uh, when it first started in there, uh, saying we should attract Aer Lingus to come to a Bradley International Airport. We had Bradley International without any international travel. Uh, but I, I was promoting that back in the day when I was the chairman of the vice chairman of the transportation committee. And I'm so happy to see that it's actually come to fruition and it's it's actually happening in a beautiful service. So having that connection with Ireland directly to Hartford has been a fantastic boom. If you were to identify or trying to work out the characteristic of the typical Connecticut person, of which there is none, of course, I mean, it's a vast state and it's plenty of people there. Would you identify anything, any, any of the characteristics that are very, very similar to those of your native Louth people? Yeah. The Connecticut is known for their Yankee ingenuity. Now, what does that mean? Uh, we were the original Yankees. Um, they called the New York Yankees the uh, the baseball team down there, which I'm a Boston fan, but that's okay. We won't go there. They were, they were split in Connecticut, Boston and New York. We were called the uh, the Yankees. And our, our song, our uh, state song is Yankee Doodle Dandy. So uh, the, the Yankees are, are Connecticutites. So back before we were nutmeggers, we were Yankees. Uh, so Yankee ingenuity uh, was a term that was brought up because – Connecticut was the number one uh, patent uh, applications in the country for for decades. And then what happened? Well, we we've had a, a series like like Ireland had a series of you know cyclical ups and downs and where we where we were and the competition is fierce between Boston and New York and where where companies are going to locate. We had a tremendous amount of co corporate headquarters that were were in Connecticut and have you know, gone to look at, at other other areas around the country for a variety of different reasons. People thought the taxes or the culture or the variety of things, but but well, we brought that back. Now, taxes we can deal with, that's a number. The culture, what's that about? Well, we're, we're kind of in a unique position. Uh, and I, I looked at that when I was doing my consultancy business, I was doing a lot of work in, in Dundalk, which Dundalk is strategically located directly between Dublin and Belfast. And Connecticut, Hartford, is strategically located between Boston and New York. Let me back to this side again. That is a clever way of doing it. That explains it rather neatly. You're dead right. Yeah. So having having those two big cities on 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 either side of us is was tough for the culture. Uh, there's so much culture, obviously, in in New York and Boston that we were able to uh, you know have, have that competition being difficult. But we had to be able to redefine ourselves and make sure that people realize that Connecticut is a friendly place uh, to do business, and uh, our governor now has made it a friendlier place to do business. I think. You know, people are realizing the benefit of staying here. And the, you've traveled Connecticut a bit yourself. It's a beautiful, beautiful state. It is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. It's straight. In fact, myself and my CMO were just talking about this the other day. It looks straight out of the movies. Uh -huh. isn't it? it is just, it's picket fence stuff. It's just beautiful. Yeah, it really, it really is. And we have, we have everything you can imagine here. You, you, you really have a beautiful state. I, I love Connecticut. I'm so happy that my parents chose Connecticut when they came over uh, to Ireland. They stayed in New York for a little while and moved up to Connecticut, and it was a, a, a great decision on their part, and I, I, I absolutely love it here. So run through some of the huge names that we did know were here, because where was Colt was here, wasn't it? Pfizer is still here. You're still the insure tech uh, capital of the world, I think. Um, financial services are huge here. But on the manufacturing side, it was a huge manufacturing place. It was, and, and manufacturing has gone all over the place. It would be hard to bring the, the true like manufacturing back, but we're doing our best to have small, innovative companies coming. One of the, one of the big companies that was here was, was Xerox uh, that uh, had a tremendous footprint in the United States and around the world, and they located actually in Dundalk when they chose their, uh, their European operation. So, uh, you know, we, we had a, a variety of big-name companies that have 
you know, have gone to other places or have, you know, gone by, by the way. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at innovative uh, ways to, you know, attract companies and, you know, attracting companies from overseas and from Ireland is a good way to, you know, keep, keep that momentum going. And Otis is based here in Farmington. I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? Okay. Uh, oh, no, there's a lot of things I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it's a very big state. I mean, it's the same. It's six odd million, isn't it, in terms of population? Uh, it's about three and a half million, actually. Oh, three and a half, sorry. And, well, there you go. It's still half the size of the island of Ireland in terms of population. But it's huge, and there are so many little pockets everywhere. For a small state geographically, it's got a it got a good dense population, so that that does make it up. If we if we we are the third smallest state in the in the in the union, so we have a, a decent population for our for our size. Any particular attractions that stand out for you when you're talking to Irish companies that want to come here to Connecticut? Do you know you say culture good? The governor is changing the tax issues here. Anything else that really is stand out? What's the workforce like? What's the availability of skilled workers? Well, we, we have a, a great emphasis on education in Connecticut. So we have, uh, on the local level, the education is is very good and, and above the rest of the country. How is that uh, measured or who measures that? It's, it's measured on, on test scores and on on, uh, on graduation rates and uh, and per capita spending on, on students. So we put a big investment into our, our students and our young people to make sure that they get a great education. And again, coming from Ireland, I don't understand the exact ways that that works. Is that driven at a state level? So does that come out of the what you used to work do in the legislature? Does it come from the governor or does it go into Washington? We have a unique set, setup in, in Connecticut where, uh, kind of like the United States where there's 50 independent states, Connecticut is broken up into 169 different municipalities. So the state government does have a State Department of Education and they do a lot of funding with school construction and they set some of the guidelines for what curriculum needs to be. Uh, but it's all based upon a lot of the 169 independent municipalities they can set, they all have elected boards of education uh, and they can focus on how much money they will invest in local property taxes, which you don't have much in Ireland, the local property property taxes. But here, depending on the town you're in, it can be quite varying degrees of, of uh, levels of property tax. And most of that property tax money goes into the school system and they have a an ability to regulate their schools on an individual basis by the municipality. But they're set by state guidelines as, as well. So in terms of you are talking to, say, your neighbors in Louth, what are the attractions or if you were pitching Tony Sheridan's New London Centre to them, what would you say to them? Well, it's a great opportunity to be able to set up on a small basis that you don't have to have a, a big operation to come over here to see how it works. Dip your toe in the water here and see for yourself with having you know the ability to rent an office or a desk for a day or for a month or for a year and build up from there. We have several different centers around the state that have that kind of capability where you can come and look at and, and test the waters. Uh, the, the Economic Development Department here is willing to work with anybody and everybody and uh, would be very, very helpful. Uh, the, the scenery that we have here is to come for, for, uh, for, for joy. The restaurants are phenomenal. The, the, the drives are beautiful. The roads are incredible. Uh, the, the ability to go down to, we have two uh, world-class casinos uh, down in Tony Sheridan's neighborhood, uh, down in, in, uh, on, the, on the shore. Uh, so there's, uh, we have uh, phenomenal arts. We have uh, Yale uh, University, our, our college in, in New Haven. Uh, New Haven is full of, of, of arts and culture, uh, and same with, with Hartford. Uh, it's a small state to get around geographically. You can get anywhere from coast to coast in the, in the state, uh, but you'd be able to, uh, to enjoy the hospitality, the food, the culture, the people. The people are very welcoming here and uh, love seeing the Irish people come here as well. And of course, you are also so familiar with Ireland that we, you know that we love New York. We, you know we love Boston. And that would be the two default places. So if you're pitching your Connecticut against the Boston, against New York, now you've already put, made the point, and I thought it was a lovely one, about uh, Dundalk being between Belfast and Dublin. Anything else that you would say that about, uh, look, at, do come here because? Well, we, we have an incredible uh, people and that's what Ireland is famous for as well. Their people are welcoming. Do you think that Connecticut people are different? I do. I th I think that. Well, you live here, so you know. Yeah, yeah. I I I, I believe that sometimes around uh, around the rest of the country, Connecticut gets a bad rap uh, that they think they were a bit standoffish. But people then come to Connecticut and realize that I think we're very warm and friendly, and we're open to people, especially if we hear hear a nice accent like an Irish accent come in. We love to talk to uh, people and welcome people to our to our state. Standoffish. I've never seen nor felt that here. That's wonderful. That's yeah. wonderful. 
We have a reputation for that around because they they look at Connecticut as being a bit snooty um, from other parts. Because of the world. it's just gorgeous. I, mean, it I can't is. tell you. It's just it's <laughs> lovely. It's the kind of place that you dreamt of when you dream of America. This could be the American dream. What about uh, the future for here? Do you think that it as a as a state it needs investment? All states need investment. What next do you think might be here that might be more even more attractive for these Irish companies that will be coming here? There's no doubt they will be coming here to base themselves here. I think you, you just never know what the next you know, Microsoft will be or Intel or uh, any kind of company that's going to start and be able to grow here. So having it be a, a partner incubator as well helps to build upon that Yankee ingenuity. That's the the magic of, I think, of what Connecticut worked for. We took small companies. Colt was a small company back in the day, and they turned into the the largest uh, manufacturer of, uh, of of weapons for from for, for military in in the, in the world, but you have you know Pfizer and um, uh, all the pharmaceutical companies that were here. We did have a strong innovation in fuel cell technology. That was one of our our budding uh, technologies and investment in fuel cell technology that I think has done some work in, in Ireland as well. But having having that Yankee ingenuity and the ability to start a company from nothing and build it up into something. We, we, we just welcome any kind of opportunity and God only knows what, what it will bring or, or develop. And you learn something every time on That Great Business Show. And I've just learned, as you mentioned earlier, that Yankee Doodle Dandy is in the <laughs> state song. Well, there you go. I can actually sing it for you. <laughs> you do know that we have a final question and it is, who would Brian McDermott hire in a heart? I think the person I would hire in a heartbeat is a guy over in Ireland, actually. I'd love to bring him here. He does come here quite uh, quite often. Is Sean Gallagher. Sean Gallagher was a guy uh, who uh, I first met when he was working in the IDA uh, over in, in Dundalk. And uh, he's a uh, turned into a, a quite a businessman in Ireland. He's a big entrepreneur. I'm sure you know uh, Sean yourself. I do. And I was MC at a function at which he spoke. And I have to say, he's a lovely, kind of genuine kind of guy. Just yes. a lovely, yes. lovely guy. Yeah. yeah. He he actually was, uh, they had, uh, we have the Shark Tank over here, uh, where they help uh, small businesses uh, pitch, their, yeah. pitch their program. He was on a program over in Ireland called The Dragon's Den. Which is uh, also run on BBC as well. Yeah, it's very, yeah. very famous. We don't have a Dragon's Den in Ireland anymore. Okay, that's too bad. We should. You should. Of course we should. I think that we are about to have a further twist in our taxation system to uh, try to get um, angel investors in so that the sharks might be back in the water again. Would that, that be good? That'd be wonderful. That'd okay. be wonderful. And final question, because there's always a final, final question. When are you going back home? I hope tomorrow. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I I used to travel there quite, quite a bit back and forth. I was there seven or eight times a year. And it's been about a year since I've been back now. So we're, Time we're, to go home. We're, time to go home tomorrow. <laughs> Brian, Brian McDermott. Ex-Senator Brian McDermott. Well, former, you. former. Former. <laughs> it wasn't a difference between a former and an ex. Don't you have an ex-wife and a former? You don't have a former wife. No. You have an ex-wife, don't yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> there's something about that. I'm doing. Former Senator yeah. Brian McDermott, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you, Connell. It was a pleasure. De facto, the revolutionary shaving oil, changing the face of shaving. For the smoothest shave of your life, just add water. No more lathering up or cleaning up afterward. Just add a few drops of water and you're ready to go. De facto's blend of all natural oils hydrates and protects your skin. No more razor burns or irritation. A spa treatment for your face. Perfect for all skin types and lasts so much longer than traditional foams or gels. De facto, a shaving revolution. Just add water. Available from selected pharmacies and from defactoshave.com. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on that great business show dot com. That great business show. And that is it for episode 176 of That Great Business Show. Great business insights and inspiration. All thanks to our lovely sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best shaving oil. And I know I've tried the others, but De Facto is the only one I use. Remember to sign up for email updates and we will send you your own personal copy of the podcast at thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Do share, do like, and do give us five star reviews. It really does help. Do advertise with us as well on That Great Business Show to engage with our incredible audience of entrepreneurs, businesses, business owners, business want-to-bees, and investors. We record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios, where today's studio engineer is the one and only Alison O'Dwyer. And later, the dynamic duo of studio manager Peter Rice and post-production engineer Neil Horner ensure we remain the world's best-sounding business podcast. So from me, Connell O'Moran, we'll see you all on the Slant Tunnel. 